Well, good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate you zooming in. Well, my name is Paul James. I'm the uh, development of, uh, director of development publishing for the Knoxville History Project, and uh, Jack Neely, the executive director with the History Project, is with me today. And uh, the reason we're doing this is because we were uh, contacted by Gail Atherton, who's one of the reps or the rep for the uh, South Haven uh, Neighborhood Association. And it just seemed like a good opportunity to um, delve in to a little bit of history of this neighborhood and see what we might find and also open it up to people who are interested in learning more about it, as well as maybe contrib contributing some stories. Um, if already you would like to share some stories, if you could put your name in the chat bar and we'll take those in order. Uh, I have no idea how many people we're gonna get today, but um, we'll get started in just a minute and then see, what, see where we go. Uh, so I'm going to um, give a little overview about the Knoxville History Project, because you may not know what we are about and what we do in the community. Um, then I'm going to uh, offer a little bit of information about South Haven, just kind of frame it for us, and then over, hand it over to Jack Neely, who's going to uh, give a, a brief history about the growth of kind of South Knoxville as a precursor to looking at what we've found just in the last couple of weeks, really, about South Haven. And then we'll finish it up, probably after about 30 minutes or so. Uh, turn it over to you folks to, to ask questions, share stories, um, you know, share what you know, what else you know or would like to know about the South Haven community. I will go ahead and get started. Again, uh, Jack, Jack Neely and I uh, work for the Knoxville History Project. Our mission is very simple. We research and promote the history and culture of Knoxville. We're the only organization dedicated to that in the city. Of course, there's uh, the East Tennessee Historical Society and all the historic homes that uh, tell some history of Knoxville or certain parts of it. But we're actually the first organization that we know of that's ever actually been created just to focus on the city of Knoxville. Um, we do talks and publications. I uh, encourage you to, uh, to join us on a Thursday evening. We do, we've been doing a weekly uh, Zoom talk uh, calling Knoxville uh, History Happy Hour now at six o'clock every Thursday. Uh, we research, uh, do private research, uh, research for the public, and we uh, do publications, uh, publish our own publications. We've done seven or eight um, stories, uh, story publications that are available on our website. Um, our bestseller is Historic Knoxville, The Curious Visitor's Guide, which is in place as we release this, I think it's the tail end of uh, 2018, we've sold about 3,500 copies. Uh, we make these available to Introduction Knoxville and Leadership Knoxville, and it's available all over town at local bookstores and shops. Uh, Mass General downtown, actually, are our top seller, but Union Avenue Books is a great seller, and uh, Visit Knoxville, who we partner with. And in this book, uh, this is really the first of its kind that we know of, uh, is the history of the downtown area, the uh, city as a whole, uh, but also uh, neighborhoods, parks and gardens, um, uh, UT uh, campus, uh, statues of downtown, uh, cemeteries and all kinds of stuff. Um, all the museums and historical collections are all bound up and this is a 200 page full color guide. And its follow up is, uh, is our first printed community history. This was on, it's on Bearden. Uh, historic Bearden, the 200 year story of the complex. And actually this is the old title, I keep putting the wrong slide up. It's the 200 year story of Knoxville's fourth Creek Valley is actually the subtitle. Um, and we've sold about 1300 of those um, in about the last nine months. So again, this is a 200 page uh, full color history of this West Knoxville community. Uh, we would love to do more of these uh, not on, on the other areas of town, particularly in South Knoxville too, of which South Haven is a part. So uh, we look forward to uh, getting that, uh, getting around to that at some point, uh, maybe sooner than later. Uh, in the Bearden book, uh, we talk about the history of uh, the early airports and we there's a little kind of uh, link to that today uh, with the uh, Knoxville's first municip municipal airport, as you may know, was down on Sutherland Avenue, right round about where West High School is but also the African-American community of the Brickyard, which would be along um, Hamburg Drive, as you know it today, but the early schools, the early settlers, uh, some of the old industries like Balm's Home of Flowers and some kind of interactive maps and stuff. So uh, if, if you're interested in learning more about Knoxville or if you've lived in Bearden or were interested in, in the city's history as a whole, uh, we encourage you to, uh, to find that. Uh, also, we're, we're building uh, an online repository of all kinds of things related to Knoxville history and culture, and you can connect through our portal 
on knoxvillehistoryproject.org, which uh, you've already been to if you've, uh, you've signed up through, um, through the website. And you can learn all kinds of things about each of uh, the city sectors uh, when we're building on this. It's not a static thing, it's a dynamic thing, it's a dy dynamic repository. Learn more about downtown or Gay Street or local historic homes or cemeteries. But if you do click on South Knoxville, uh, you'll find that we've already added uh, entries about Island Home Community, uh, the quarries at Irons, uh, Irons itself, the history, which I know about because I, uh, I was the director at Irons for 12 years and worked there for four years before. I don't have a slide, but uh, I did the history uh, in pictures of the Irons family and the development of the Nature Centre and also helped with the, uh, the, the South Knoxville title as well, by the way, uh, which uh, Tasha and Shannon Mahorin did uh, a few years as part of the Images of America series. Uh, as you can see, we've got information, uh, some stories about Sevier Avenue and also Island Home uh, Oral Histories, including we talked to uh, Sherry Wallace Barry who's with us today and her sister Sharon about growing up uh, on Island Home Boulevard uh, in the late 40s, early 50s. So obviously we have the scope here to, to create something about South Haven and, and make it available to you and, and everyone else. Um, also, you can connect to learn more about Knoxville. Um, you know, we used to uh, oversee the Knoxville Mercury newspaper before it uh, folded, sadly, a few years ago, but uh, the archive is on there. Uh, you can also learn more about the, the downtown art wraps. Uh, we've done 25 of these around downtown. Uh, closest to South, South Haven would be up at uh, James White Parkway and East Hill Avenue. Uh, and we've got four new ones going in uh, along Magnolia Avenue, which we're doing for the, with the city. Um, where you might come in is to help us if you have any old photographs of Knoxville, not just South Haven, but of anything related to Knoxville that of interest, could be street scenes, buildings, could be events. Uh, our program called Knoxville Shoebox encourages people like you to share them. You don't have to donate, we're asking just to share them digitally. So as you can see on here, uh, we've got all kinds of uh, diverse history from industry to uh, down the bottom is, uh, is police officers involved in a shootout. Uh, with Kid Curry and the turn of the century to um, more recent ones. Uh, at the top left, you've got Stray Cats playing down at uh, a club on Cumberland Avenue in the 1980s. Uh, one of the most amazing ones we have is, uh, is on, on the right here is Louis Armstrong, um, shared with us a collection of photographs of Louis Armstrong playing at uh, Jacob Building at mm. Chill Howie Park in 1957. So if you have anything to share, we, we would love to talk to you about that. Today, again, thank you for joining us. Um, this has been a great opportunity for us to learn more about the community. Um, so we're can, talking to Gail Atherton. Um, she gave me a tip actually uh, a couple of days ago about the uh, Office of Neighborhoods with the city. You can log on to knoxvilletennessee.gov. Uh, really, uh, helpfully, they, they do, um, if, if the neighborhoods are registered, do have a graphic that define who, where, um, these neighborhoods are. So as you can see here, this is kind of the, the curious boundary of South, South Haven, all the way from the river, Tennessee River, all the way kind of down to Baker Creek um, on the south and James White Parkway on the west and all the way over kind of the, uh, the Iams quarries and stuff uh, on the east. Um, just doing a little kind of precursory research on South Haven, uh, you know, one of the things that we look for are, are landmarks and uh, there may be others that you'd like to add to this list, but we'll, we've certainly want to talk today a little bit about Mary James Park, uh, the uh, kind of historic cemetery, which you may or may not know about, uh, just a few yards from there, the old Giffen School, which is closed currently, uh, Maynard Glen Boarfields, um, up on the fringe of Long Island Home, is that uh, the remnant of the old grocery? And mm -hmm. also you may have interest, be interested about the Handy Dandy, that's obviously a, a very, um, a visible place and has been around a long time, uh, the Roundup, Roundup uh, restaurant and also as many of I'm sure you know, uh, people are moving into the community because of the bike trails in this in the urban wilderness stuff. So I'm going to pause it there for a moment and uh, kind of hand it over to uh, to Jack and uh, you can have a look at this, uh, this is kind of a zoomed in uh, map of 1895 of uh, a map of mm -hmm. Knox County and ask Jack just to talk a little bit about the growth of South Knoxville. When did it become annexed by the city and what, what, what might we know that would help us kind of frame South Haven? Over to you, Jack. Thanks a lot, Paul, and thanks everybody for joining us. A beautiful, beautiful day. And uh, I think it, any day is a beautiful day when you're talking about history. So uh, I, uh, I, I, South Knoxville's history, I think, is, is safely 
if people are journalists are warned to not use the word unique um, uh, unless they can prove it. And I think we can prove that the South Knoxville's history is uh, unlike the history of any other uh, place that, uh, that we know about probably. Um, it was once considered uh, remote uh, because the Tennessee River was kind of wild. Uh, it was accessible only by ferries in, uh, before the Civil War um, and, um, and, and then not in all kinds of weather. Um, the uh, first bridges uh, were began to be built during the Civil War. The, I think the Union Army built the first uh, uh, so-called permanent bridge, but they weren't that dependable, and at least two of them were destroyed by weather events, uh, floods, and, uh, and a, what was referred to as a, as a cyclone. I think it was a, a tornado uh, took down one, um, but uh, it, it South Knoxville was important uh, to Knoxville. Uh, it was outside of city limits. It wasn't considered part of Knoxville for a long time, but it was it was important because it had a lot of uh, industry over there, mainly, especially marble. Uh, it was one of our main uh, main sources of marble. We know the Meads and Ross quarry uh, stories uh, better than some, but there were other quarries, as, as you know, uh, across uh, across South Knoxville. And, uh, and lumber companies, of course, the Vestal Lumber Company um, was a very big deal at one time. I, I didn't realize this until I did some research uh, that, that they were the main suppliers of wood for Steinway pianos at one time. Um, but, uh, but also for some very, what some, what some individuals accomplished on South Knoxville, I think is another reason that it was important even in the 19th century. And one of them was a guy whose name you see in this map is uh, he was known as Colonel Perez Dickinson. He was from Massachusetts originally, from Amherst, Massachusetts. And if uh, if you connect the name Dickinson and Amherst, you may have heard of the the Bell of Amherst, whose name was Emily Dickinson. That was his cousin, a younger, I think, first cousin once removed is how they were related. Uh, but she actually carried on car, uh, correspondence with some of her Knoxville cousins. Um, uh, the stories that she actually visited here are very hard to prove. I'll just say that. Um, but uh, anyway, it's uh, Dickinson was a was a fascinating guy. Was one of the people that they called merchant princes. He made a lot of money as a merchant, and uh, mainly in downtown Knoxville. And uh, right as, at, at the time, the city was growing extremely fast in the mid to late nineteenth century. Um, and he he had a home on Main Street, but he also had his island home, as he called it. It was a it was a it was a rural place, a, a farm, and it wasn't just for him. He was a, a, a widower. His wife had died when he was very young, so he lived most of his life alone. Uh, but he he had he established this farm that became just uh, something that he invited the community to uh, occasionally, including. Uh, uh, graduating classes at UT would come to his farm. Uh, one time there was a, a large uh, or, uh, organization, a national organization of African Americans that met in downtown Knoxville and he invited them to come over and see this amazing farm that was a show place. It, was, it had gardens and it had uh, experimental areas where he was trying new crops. He had uh, was very proud of his uh, both uh, livestock and, uh, and uh, uh, growing things. Um, but it was a uh, uh, but a fascinating guy who was there a long time. He lived a long life and died in the very early 20th century. Um, but uh, the uh, uh, during this time, uh, uh, by the way, I, I should mention, I mentioned that South Knoxville was considered remote, even when there were bridges there sometimes, they weren't always there. Uh, and uh, people began talking of making fun of South Knoxville in, in Knoxville in a way that I think South Knoxville is kind of, South Knoxville is kind of enjoyed because they, they took to it. South Knoxville was called South America uh, in the uh, 1880s and 90s, and, and uh, it was it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek sort of joke that you don't necessarily expect to find in the Victorian era. It sounds like a modern ironic, uh, uh, like a David Letterman sort of joke, but but they called it that's what they called it. And at least uh, once or twice, when they had parades downtown, different neighbors would come out and and present themselves. And and uh, I've run across a couple times where the South Knoxville would come dressed as gauchos and, and as South Americans in this uh, in this parade. Um, and, and maybe uh, being so remote was good for some things like dairies. There were some dairies down there and, and uh, I, I have gathered that, uh, that, that cows don't produce milk very well when they're when they're uh, when they're interrupted by uh, noise and things, and there was less uh, was less of that on the south side. Maybe it was a better place for for dairies. Uh, South Knoxville was known for several things. One uh, uh, is um, it was 
uh, by 1880, there was a, our, I think our most popular horse racing track was on the south side of the river, even though it was not in Knoxville. Uh, you, you could walk across the bridge or ride your horse or get carriage across the bridge and go to a horse racing track that was exactly where Sutry Landing Park is now. Um, it was a half mile oval. It was uh, run in the 1880s by a, a, a former slave uh, named uh, Cal Johnson. Uh, we know that Cal Johnson later established his permanent racetrack in East Knoxville, but in the 1880s, he leased a racetrack uh, for several years and, and hosted a lot of uh, horse races there, uh, as well as bicycle races. This was the early days of bicycle races, and they had bicycle races on this, uh, on this horse racing track involving both black and white uh, bicycle racing teams. Um, but uh, that's uh, an interesting heritage of that that I didn't know about until they actually the city began talking about making that a, a park. And I thought, well, gosh, what what was that originally? And that the park contained the whole area that used to be the uh, the horse racing track. Um, it's hard to find flat ground and that close to downtown, and that's what it made, it made it such a good place for it. Later, it was UT's uh, one of UT's early uh, track uh, uh, track fields uh, that uh, before UT had, had spread out off of, of the top of the hill. Um, but anyway, the Gay Street Bridge, uh, I guess the first permanent and dependable bridge that lasted more than a few years was uh, was built in 1898. And that, uh, you know, suddenly made Knoxville more, South Knoxville more interesting. And I, I don't like to talk about the Gay Street Bridge without mentioning, uh, Paul mentioned earlier briefly, uh, Kid Curry uh, escaped from, uh, shot a couple of cops uh, in, in, in a saloon in 1901 was held on federal charges for a year and a half in downtown Knoxville. Uh, famous outlaw, he was uh, an associate of Butch Cassidy's and, and them, but, uh, but was, a, was a known, known, known to be a deadly killer. He's probably guilty of 30 or 40 murders in his, in his life. Um, but he, uh, he, uh, the, the last time he was seen alive for certain was when he uh, stole the sheriff's horse and rode it across the Gaysier Bridge and vanished into the wilds of, uh, of South Knoxville. And, in, uh, in June of 1903. Um, I'm especially, I'm, I've spent most of my life in journalism and, I, and I'm especially interested in, in a, a guy from this area precisely uh, called, uh, named uh, Paul Y. Anderson. And I don't know whether you've heard his name before, but he won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for uh, journalism in 1920. Eight, I want to say, uh, it, for uh, for his uh, exposing uh, the details of the Teapot Dome scandal of the Harding and Coolidge administrations. He was a, a, a tough journalist. He grew up tough. He was a quarryman's son from South Knoxville. His, his father was killed in a quarry accident, Derrick accident, when he was very young. Um, I'd like to find out more details about that and where he lived exactly. Uh, later on, his uh, his mother lived on Phillips uh, Avenue uh, near near the uh, uh, Sutter Landing Park. Uh, and he stayed there with her when he would come back home. But, uh, but he has a very interesting grave, if you've not seen it, at uh, the Allen Home Baptist Church. Uh, that's where he's born. The, the grave was actually uh, paid for by a journalist across America who chipped in uh, to, to buy an especially stylish uh, uh, grave for their, their colleague that they respected so much. Um, Another interesting guy that uh, that had a lot to do with South Knoxville, of course, was Harry P. Imes, and and uh, Paul knows much more about him than I do. But by 1910, he had established his his home and bird sanctuary on the South Side, um, and uh, and and that uh, kind of uh, in amazing ways just grew into what we know as uh, as Imes Nature Center over the years. Uh, South Knoxville couldn't. Uh, 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 couldn't exist on its own as, as South America forever. Uh, so finally in 1917, and Knoxville was growing by leaps and bounds and uh, they annexed all on all four sides of the city. And for the first time ever in 1917, uh, part, uh, Knoxville included part of South Knoxville as part of the city. Uh, before that, it was just you know South Knox County. Um, so that was, uh, that was a big change, uh, but we, uh, uh, and that kind of, uh, uh, contributed to the popularity of, of South Knoxville as a residential area. Of course, uh, Island Home was the first uh, uh, residential neighborhood that was established in South Knoxville. And it was, uh, it had a, a streetcar, an electric streetcar, and was, was that went back and forth across the Gay Street Bridge and uh, was, it was very accessible from uh, anywhere on, on, on Gay Street you could just to get, get a streetcar to, uh, to Island Home. Um, and uh, this was a, a, you know, a, a place that was easy to live even without a car in, in those uh, 1915, 1920, that, that era. Um, 
And uh, at the same time, uh, Island Home is also associated today with uh, with an airport, and that airport goes way back. Uh, it, one of the earliest airports in Knoxville was on that on, on Dickinson Island, uh, there where the uh, downtown Island Airport is today, uh, and that goes back to the early 1920s, I believe. Uh, and there was a, we, when we did the Bearden research, uh, we found out that there were uh, there were kind of competing airports for a while. Bearden had its airport. On Southern Avenue, and uh, and they had the the Allen Home Airport, and then there was another one up at Whittle Springs, um, but they were uh, all kind of vying to be the Knoxville Airport. And Bearden finally uh, finally got the, the crown just for a few years, though, before it moved to uh, to Blount County. Uh, but that the there's a good deal of air history with uh, with uh, the the history of Island Home there. And of course, in 1924, the uh, Tennessee School for the Deaf, which was a a very big deal when it was founded in the 1840s. Uh, was a uh, arguably a bigger deal than the university was because it was before the university was the University of Tennessee. We had a state, the state, uh, the state college for the deaf, and it's the only eighth uh, school for the deaf in America. Um, so this was a big deal for Knoxville to have back in the early days, and it was downtown in the uh, building we now know as the LMU uh, uh, Law School building uh, until 1924 when they moved uh, uh, to a part of uh, Colonel Dickinson's uh, property. And, uh, and establish their, their place there. And, and actually uh, Dickinson's uh, Island home, his Island house that he, that he, where he hosted parties is part of uh, TSD's campus. Um, but of course, uh, 1920s was the era that everything was changing because the automobile was, was, uh, was becoming accessible to the middle class. And, uh, and you see just suddenly uh, everybody's changing the way they live. Everybody used to be, be crowded downtown before that, uh, even wealthy people. But in the 1920s, you, uh, automobiles were meant you could, you could live almost anywhere within 20 miles of, of downtown if you wanted to. And uh, so a lot of places that had not seemed developable because they were not uh, accessible to streetcar lines. It, it's hard to build streetcars up and down hills um, so the, uh, the hilly areas had not been developed before, but suddenly in the 1920s, we see all these hilly areas being developed, uh, including Sequoia Hills, uh, North Hills, uh, Holston Hills, and Lindbergh Forest. I think they're all equivalent kind of uh, developments, and they look very similar. In fact, you could drop someone in, in one, one or the other and say, guess, guess which uh, neighborhood you're in. It might take a while to figure that out. Um, because they were all they're all very 1920s neighborhoods with a new kind of style of, of kind of building roads uh, in the contours of hills, which hadn't been uh, easy to do in the time of the streetcar, uh, which needed like uh, flat straight streets. Uh, so th this was this was kind of a new way to live. Lindbergh Forest, you may know, was was uh, established in 1927, which was a big uh, when Lindbergh was one of the biggest names in America. Charles Lindbergh. It just landed in in uh, in Paris, and uh, the uh, there was a newspaper contest about what to name this new this new place, which could have been called uh, South Hills or something. But uh, but there was a uh, national contest, and I wanted to call it Lindbergh Forest. But that was uh, that was um, that you know that's still a, a lovely place. It hadn't changed all that much in, in over the years. Um, but uh, maybe the one of the biggest. Uh, uh, changes in South Knoxville, of course, was happened in, in, in the 1920s also. It began uh, building here as a grassroots effort beginning in 1903 uh, with an idea by a woman named Annie Davis who thought it'd be great to have a, uh, a national park in the Smoky Mountains. And uh, in this count of her, her husband and several friends, and she was elected to office, our first female state representative from Knoxville, went to Nashville to make help make this happen. Um, but but we uh, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park was substantially finished by 1930, and uh, and 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 the one problem was we needed a, a better way to get there rather than all the little dirt roads that led there. So they built uh, Chapman Highway in, in the early 1930s, and Chapman Highway was the nation's main route to the the, the nation's most populous uh, uh, national park. Uh, so that was a a very big deal in the, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, uh, Chapman Highway developed a, a, a tourist economy of its own uh, with, uh, with hotels and hot dog stands and, and souvenir shops and all, all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of things up and down the, the highway. I think that gives, the, the Smokies tourism gives Chapman Highway a lot of its distinct uh, uh, look and feel. Um, but anyway, we've, uh, uh, Paul and I between us have done a lot of piecemeal research about the, about South Knoxville over the years. Uh, Paul, wrote, of course, wrote a, a great book about Iams uh, that I, I learned a lot from. Um, 
but uh, our recent uh, KHP Knoxville History Project projects have uh, pertained to the Isle at Home and, and uh, Luttrell Park, which is an old park that used to be where Baptist Hospital was later built. Um, the uh, the Union Forts, of course, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Dickinson and, and Higley and uh, Stanley, and, uh, uh, and of course about Perez Dickinson, we've written about him some over the years, and uh, and and we've done some stuff about Sevier Avenue as well, as well as uh, Sutry Landing Park. But uh, we're this isn't a presentation for me. That we want to hear your stories, your opinions, your your ideas about what what makes uh, South Haven and 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 what what is is what what should we remember about South Haven? What what are the uh, hallmarks of what makes South Haven a, a different sort of a place? We're we're on a fact finding mission mainly today, but uh, would love to hear any any ideas, questions, or or, or comments or stories. Uh, anything that you that you uh, uh, think is is important to know. I, I found that. Um, it's funny, a lot of older folks say, uh, uh, say the, the younger kids, they have no respect for history, but I, I found the opposite to be true lately, that especially uh, young people coming in to uh, start a brew pub or a, or a bike trail or, or whatever they're doing, are often very interested in the, in the history of the place and want to, and want to uh, connect to it somehow when they uh, are naming things or, or planning things. Uh, so uh, we want to be able to help uh, make connections uh, in this regard, um, and, uh, and 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 find out what uh, you know. No, no, everybody moves into a new place, and and I, I think uh, South Haven has had a lot of new residents, and in, in, uh, in recent years we'll probably have more. Wants to know something about this place, and how does it connect to uh, to the American history as they know it, and uh, and and. You know, find uh, you know, find a, 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 you know, a sense of a sense of place that they, they want to find the there there to paraphrase Gertrude Stein, but I, I think we can do that through uh, through a, a study of, uh, of of local history. But I'll turn it back over to uh, to you, um, Paul, and and to the and to the group. Uh, if, yeah. Uh, Before we do open it up, thank you, Jack, for that the great context. Um, I just wanted to kind of briefly highlight some of the things that we've been able to find in the last, just the last couple of weeks, just delving in for a few hours. Um, nothing what I'm going to present here is, uh, is final at all. I mean, it, a lot of these things, like many things in history, kind of uh, present more questions sometimes than they do present answers. But, um, and, and before we start, Jack, uh, do you have any other um, information, do you have any, any other statement about um, Perez Dickinson, why he called it Island Home? Was it just because it was next to the large island and probably before the, temp the TBA uh, reservoir system, there was maybe smaller islands there as well? Uh, yes, well, that, that island was a notable island before, uh, yeah, uh, when there were still some shoals and things in the, uh, in the, in the water, that Island Home was, uh, you know, probably the biggest island in the, in the immediate Knoxville, Knoxville area. And, uh, and I think he, he had, uh, he had his uh, a kind of a grand house on, on Main Street, but his island home was, was where he, I think, preferred to spend, uh, to spend time. But yeah. Okay, thanks, Jack. Well, the, the first person I want to mention, uh, as many of you know, one of the, one of the um, most iconic la uh, landmarks in South Haven is Mary James Park. And so what is the history about that? And, um, you know, before 1917, it's, uh, you know, when this area was annexed by the city, it is harder to find out information, not that it isn't out there, but um, and we definitely look forward to the challenge of learning more about this. But uh, we were able to find that uh, Mary James's husband, uh, N.T. James, what N.T. stands for, I don't know yet, uh, but he was uh, born in Alabama. Uh, he was a soldier in the Spanish-American War and uh, decided to stay in, in Cuba where he was, uh, where he was in service uh, after that conflict and was planning on um, developing a, a dairy farm there. But he did, uh, did not do that as far as we know, or at least initially, um, have been able to research, but uh, moved to Knoxville and purchased some property in, in South Knoxville, around South, in where South Haven is now, um, and set up what seems to be called the Island Home Dairy Farm. Now that's a puzzle in itself because there was also a dairy farm on the Perez Dickinson estate. In fact, if you look at some old Sanborn fire insurance maps, even around about 1917, that dairy looks almost about where Iams is today or where the Iams family um, f first um, purchased property. So um, that's N.T. James, uh, him and his wife, uh, Mary, 
uh, ran the Island Home Dairy Farm probably for about 40 years. Um, she ended up running on her own while her husband was uh, looking after a couple of other dairies elsewhere. I think one of them was in uh, North Knoxville. Um, but so they were, they were quite well known. Um, so like I said, it's a slight puzzle that they were calling their dairy Island Home Dairy when the other one seemed to have that name. Whether that definitively is true and I'm, I'm still a little puzzled by that, but certainly that they were very, uh, very well known. And as far as I can tell, this um, expansive dairy was along what we would call, you know, round about where the park is now, along um, kind of going east, along McClung, I think it's McClung Street or McClung Avenue. But here in, um, moving my stuff around the screen, here in, when you're hosting, you have all kinds of things open. In 19, we have an ad in 1938 claiming that they have over 40 years of service. Um, Serving, serving Knoxville with, with milk, which would date, you know, around about 1900, if they were rounding off. Um, the only one photograph that I found was in uh, the Knoxville Journal of 1939, uh, is this gentleman, Sam Lowerty. It uh, doesn't really give you too much of a hint of the, of the property, but um, at least it was uh, at least 115, if not double that in acreages as well. Um, here's an ad for 1932. Again, a little puzzle, Pine Hill Road. Is this the same Pine Hill? lane that's uh, just east of Redbud off Sevierville Pike. Um, somewhat familiar with that property because when I was at Iams, we did acquire for Iams um, what we called it that uh, ended up calling the Burnett uh, Ridge because it was uh, sold to Iams for a very uh, appreciative rate uh, by Jonathan Burnett and the Burnett family had been up there for quite a while and that's where the climbing crag is if you're familiar with that area. Uh, around that slag pit area of uh, the old Ross Marble Quarry. Um, but in 1928, uh, Jack was talking about the, uh, the Knoxville airports, uh, comes this curious headline, 115 acre James Farm is picked to become the new municipal airport or the, or the location for it. So what this seems to indicate, and as we know, this did not happen, it did go to Bearden, um, the Bearden Field that was already active turned into the municipal airport for Knoxville, I think, about 1929. And I haven't been able to figure out why. Why was it chosen and then not and, and then not used? Uh, but it does obviously, um, it's obviously a fairly flat area, as we know, along along the Klong, uh, going east from um, maybe James Park on, on South Haven Road. So we, we'd like to learn more about that. And um, why? In the 20s, in the late 20s, while uh, there was a lot of uh, eyes and ears on this property, comes this curious story. Uh, it was at least the first time I'd heard about it. Uh, Jack has heard about this a little bit in the past, is that uh, it came to prominence about this tiny cemetery uh, in the middle of the acreage lot that was identified for the airport, uh, relating to, um, way back to not only our, um, our one of our founding families, the, the, James, the you know, James White's family, including his son, Moses White, who, who was buried there along with his wife. Uh, this cemetery, I've not vis visited yet, but it's, uh, it's off uh, Hackman Street, which is just a couple of streets away, a couple of streets east of uh, Mary James Park off South Haven Road. And then in, um, I think this was, it, yeah, 1940, uh, there was a story about it. Uh, and this is a photograph um, from 1940 of that cemetery. Um, love to learn more about the cemetery. And then there's a, there's a curious uh, mention in the article, uh, which again, Jack and I had not heard this before, and it's something that does need to be uh, substantiated. But um, apparently it says, according to this article, I'll, I'll read it to you. It says, after leaving the settlement, um, James White and his family lived on what is now Riverside Drive. And we know that to be fact. Of course, that's on the north side of the river. And then across the river of what is now the James Farm stone chimney of the old white cabin stood on the James White farm and it was still standing in 1940 according to this but the cabin he lived in uh, was burned many years pre previous to that so whether some of these remnants are still there around that cemetery uh, definitely needs to be um, determined uh, this is just one of the photo this is a photograph that uh, found on online of, of um, this James Cemetery related to presumably that some of the James family were buried there or still are, of course, as well as the, as the White Baker Center uh, Cemetery. So 
Mary James Park, it seems to me, was established, I think, in the 1950s. I don't have a definitive date. Maybe you can help us with that in a couple of minutes. Um, but it was named after not MT, but, but his wife, who was managing that farm, um, it seems like on her own later in life. This is the only picture that I've been able to find of her um, in 1959, when she, just before she died. Well, did, wait a minute. I'm things covering up the dates. Yeah, 1938 rather is, is on the left when she was presenting one of her long-standing employees with his cape. But of course, we know that she died in 1959 and, and the park was named after her. Um, it's very much similar to Imes perhaps, you know, a lot of people have believed over the years that the Imes family donated their property to become a park. That's not correct. They did sell it to the city to establish um, a, a nature center. Um, but they did they did receive funds for it. Whether that happened in the case of Mary James, we don't just don't know yet. Uh, but it, one of the very few articles we've found at least did tell us that uh, she lived at least 15 years uh, longer than her husband who died presumably in 44. Uh, you know, another uh, landmark of South Haven is, is the old Giffen School. Uh, would seem to have a history like many of the elementary schools, uh, like the, the, the one along uh, Kingston Pike in Bearden that we researched for the Bearden book. Um, it was rebuilt in, uh, in the late 20s, and um, I'm not exactly sure or can't recall when it, uh, it, it stopped serving the community, but uh, if you go along Beach Street or Beach Lane, which is just behind Mary James Park or just west of there, uh, you can peer through the chain link mail, the chain link fence and see see the school. I, I think it was the remote area medical was there for a while. Uh, it's been proposed to be redeveloped. Is it under development right now? I'm not exactly sure. Maybe you can answer that question for us today. Um, and here's a few pictures of it. This, uh, a few pictures of when the school uh, reopened uh, and its new guys in 1928. And this is just, just a couple of shots uh, from the McClung Historical Collection, which we use a lot uh, for our imagery uh, as part of the Knoxville um, Public Library, which is online. This is from 1937. Maybe you have some ancestors or relatives that, uh, that went there. And here's one from 1938, class of 1938. They don't dress like that anymore, do they? I don't think these kids. I actually did get some uh, more information on that recently. Um, or uh, so we'll have kind of time later to talk yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm about almost through. So uh, like, if I just finished, we'll definitely come back to you, Thomas. Thank you. So the, the next few, just to close, are just really uh, two or three slides, a few ads um, about the kind of the development of the neighborhood. Uh, this is an ad from 1924. This is kind of interesting because it talks about uh, this Watson property. I don't really know much about this Watson property. Maybe you do, but it, this ad refers to the famous DC Watson greenhouse property on Giffen. I think Giffen was retitled McClung, um, but I've not found any information in the newspaper repository about who Watson was or what that greenhouse was about. Um, other than the fact that if you go back to that map of Knox County in 1895, um, it does mention the name Watson ran about where McClung would be. So that's it would seem to, to indicate that that's where it was. Uh, it's talking about this property being developed into 87 lots. And this is 1924. Um, this is a curious one from seven years later in, in 1931. Uh, this talks about um, 17 firemen losing their jobs in the city's economic, economic program during the Great Depression. And this fella, Herman Lynch, who was a resident of Haven Road, who was a fireman, but also he, uh, he had chickens and he, he gave 17 chickens. So maybe there's a, um, there's a culture of philanthropy and neighborliness uh, in South Haven going back all the way to the 30s and before. So just threw that in there. Uh, here's another ad from 1938 um, promoting South Haven Hills. Of course, one thing we think, you know, uh, South Haven Road used to be called just Haven. Um, does South Haven Hills have any currency today? I, I'm not familiar with that, but I don't live there. So again, we're just offering things up that might resonate with you. Uh, this is talking about uh, 14 beautiful lots, part of a wooded restricted close, close to Giffin, Giffin School and the local bus line. Uh, here in 1944, the city grants a permit for 116 homes in South Knoxville. Um, with also another potential 60. So, uh, you know, complete 176 housing project is bounded by South Haven Road, 
Mekong Avenue, McKeever Street. I'm not sure where that is exactly. Um, but yeah, and you, you start to see that really the South Haven neighborhood is really rapidly developing by the, by the mid forties. The other landmark I want to kind of close on today is again, it's, it, it poses some questions. Um, you may be familiar with this, this is 2300 Island Home, right on the fringe of, of your community, right there on Island Home, opposite Island Home Baptist uh, Church, and also the entrance to Fish Place and the Island Home Park neighborhood. Uh, and also down the street is, 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 um, is, is, is Fisher, yeah, and, and Gilbert is just uh, slightly uh, east of there. Um, the couple that uh, live there, I think it's uh, the Salters, Erin and um, Zach, I think, uh, kind of done this up and lived there for a few years. But uh, it seems that I, I, whether it was exactly the same location as this white grocery at, um, it was 300 uh, Island Home. These are, these are some photographs from McClung. Again, is there not definitive correlation? Where was this grocery? Is it the same place? Um, the one thing we do know, according to uh, information on the Klung, is that the wagon here at the back uh, is was owned by the Island Home Dairies, the, the truck drivers there. Um, so that's that's something we, we're trying to piece together. Where were these groceries? Is this the same one? Was it the same location? If you do look at old phone 308, I was able to look up that through newspapers.com, and the location was in the vicinity of of the death school, which 2300 now, it, it, it is, but again, this, we're looking at the same thing. Um, anyway, what we know is that the surely was in the vicinity of South Haven. Uh, there's a neat kind of interior as well on the plong, so uh, it's kind of a neat view into the past right there. I think this was around about 1915 or, or maybe slightly earlier, perhaps. Sometimes the, the dates are not always uh, on the money. Um, here's an ad from the Island Home Grocery at 300 Island Home. Pike uh, was sold to Carl Anderson. Anderson is another name that is in, in several parts uh, uh, mentioned on that map. A um, couple more. Uh, in 1952, Island Home Grocery at 2300 Island Home Pike um, opening up again for business um, under the personal management of the Webs. Um, someone who's been doing some research for us. Um, his father remembers it as Buddy's uh, grocery um, in the in the seventies. So that's another uh, landmark of South Haven that we would love to uh, learn more about. So uh, that's just kind of a quick overview of some of the information and history that we've been able to find just in the last couple of weeks. But we would love, uh, you know, we're going to open it up, and uh, anyone wants to uh, contribute some memories, stories, questions, uh, we'll try the best to answer them. Thomas, do you want to, you, you mentioned a comment, if you want to um, rephrase that, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. So um, through Tommy, I was actually able to get in touch with uh, David Cockrell. So he owns our owned uh, Red Chair Architects, which is now relocating to Uncle Lim's on, uh, or the previous Uncle Lim's on Severe Avenue. Um, he recently sold that to a larger architecture firm, beside the point. Um, so I had a friend that um, was interested in kind of getting in touch with him. And uh, we talked to him a little bit. Uh, sounds like, so they were going to turn it into um, a somewhat of an assisted living facility, um, kind of uh upscale um with a, a bar and everything um they've done of i want to say over a million dollars in investment uh in abatement etc um at some point the financing firm that um they were getting uh, their financing through um, changed management and, uh, you know, all of a sudden they wanted a lot more collateral as guarantees, which he wasn't really willing to do. Um, so as of now, he's, he's kind of open to ideas, outside investment, whatever. Um, uh, you know, I've actually uh, talked to some of the people uh, across the street and in the neighborhood and um, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, if we could get a giant brewery food hall in there, you know, we'd be excited. <laughs> um, of course, that would 
um, come with different zoning. And um, I think in the original um, purchase and um, deal with the city, uh, the historical context uh, needed to be maintained. And I don't know what all that entails, um, but I would assume that uh, there would need to be a lot of public support and uh, support in the city to you know change it to anything besides residential. Um, oh, and the reason that I was interested is it's actually in my backyard. So, um, wow. I connect to it um, through a branch of Baker Creek. Um, so I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> Great. Appreciate you uh, sharing that uh, update, Thomas. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, obviously for people who lived in the South Haven uh, community quite a long time, change is coming fast and it seemed like nothing really changed much in South Knoxville uh, for a long time, but um, it, it definitely it's, it's a new day. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we do as a history project is help you understand the, the history and culture and um, what's, you know, what's been coming in the rear view mirror in, in your area. Yeah, I've got a, um, my name's Nathan. I actually, Hi. my family lives in the, um, the dairy home, uh, the, the farmhouse of the Island Home Dairy Farm on South Haven. So are you living yeah. there? Sir? Yeah. And uh, I have some uh, information that I've heard from other people about some of the stuff. I thought it might be a good time to share it. And it's Please related do. to some of the things you mentioned. Um, supposedly it was built in 1892. I don't know if the James has bought it uh, from someone else because it, it's not on the 1895 map. So. I'm not sure when it was actually built, but supposedly 1892, and I didn't do the research for that. That was, you know, when we sold, we bought the house four years ago. Um, for Mary James Park, I was told by one of the, the son, there was a, the, a widow that moved in here with her three sons in 1963. And one of the sons inherited it, uh, Kitty McDaniels was the widow, and um, Daniel McDaniels sold us the house. He uh, he said that he he looked into Mary James and. Apparently, what he told me is there was a there was a, a spring on the property, and local people would come get their water there. And so they, the Mary James or the James family donated the land so that um, people could still come and uh, you know get get their you know water from the spring whenever they wanted to. Um, and the deal was the city was not supposed to close up the spring, and they did apparently at some point. Um, someone else told me there used to be like a little pool there; people would swim in, or the kids would swim in. Um, uh, let's see, other things you mentioned, the uh, property, uh, the, the airport uh, property from, from the farm. Um, I got all the, a bunch of documents that the people who lived here before had done some research on it. And so I have like a list of documents. Um, I, in my head from reading a long time ago was that it was a 350 acre farm originally. Um, 350. 350, I think. That's by memory. I'd have, to, I'd have to pull up the documents to look at it again. Um, but the property boundaries were mainly marked by so many fence posts down this road um, and, you know, a, tr a tree, a large tree here. So nothing I could use to, you know, try to verify where the boundaries were. But apparently it went to the, I think it maybe went to the river. Um, but the, uh, where Maynard Glen ball fields are, used to be a, a radio tower. Um, and one of the sons that grew up here told me they used to go camping up there uh, when it was still a radio tower. I guess it was a big open part of uh, plot of land. Maybe that was associated with where the airport was going to be. I don't know. Um, my neighbor up the street, uh, it's a 1920s house, I think. Um, he said it was a, it was a farmhouse, you know, a, a house for, for workers on the farm here. And he said there was an old, a really old um, chimney that was either incorporated, I think incorporated into the house. So, and going back to the log cabin chimney you're talking about, he says very, very old, old rocks. And it was sticking up the top of the house. They didn't like that. So they actually took it down off the top of the house. I don't know if it's still interior, uh, in the interior of the house, it's still there or not. But that might be, um, that's just you know, a couple blocks from the, from the, the cemetery you were referencing. So what tree uh, you live on it's on South Haven. Um, right next you live to, on South Haven? Yeah, right next to Mary James Park. Okay. He's uh, my next door neighbor. <laughs> yeah, my next right. door, yeah, so I was my next door neighbor. Um, so Giffen School was... We can like you know behind our house uh, across a little a little creek here. Um, let's see anything else that I want to mention. Sorry, you covered a lot of topics and things I've, I've been thinking about or looking into. Um, 
there's a right where uh, if you're going to um, um, you would know this going to uh, Iams, but right where South Haven splits off from Island Home Pike. Um, if you continue, you know, there's like you have to take a hard left. Uh, the Island Home Pike takes a hard, you know, curve. If you go straight that South Haven Road, right where you make that turn on a South Haven Road on the this would be the west side of the road, right next to um, Baker Creek, uh, is a is an it's, an, it's no one's living there now. There's an old, apparently it's an 1800s, like tiny looking house. It doesn't look like an 1800s house, um, but it, apparently from, you know, the property records or the KGIS anyway, it's, it says 1899, I think for the, and it shows up in the old, older maps, not the 1895 map, but um, 1935 map. Um, I'm wonder, I was just curious about it, whether it was maybe like a, um, um, a place where people could get, can get their milk from the dairy. Like it might've been a little, I don't know, you know, maybe a either starter house or maybe like just a little, you know, um, not, not market, but a storefront sort of for the dairy. I don't know. Um, one of the uh, sons that lived here said that people used to come, uh, so that it's, it's the farmhouse where I live. There was a driveway loop that went up to the front porch and he told us that people would come and uh, pick up their milk and there was like a Apparently, a spot on the front porch where they could drop off their milk tokens and you know pick up their milk in some way, um, and so they would find milk tokens from the farm. We're just digging around and you know flower beds and stuff. And I found a few of them here at, at the house. And they say NT James, oh, cool. old phone. <laughs> uh, and I found like, about four different types of them. My garage is apparently like a milking shed. Is that yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, I heard, yeah. So um, the Thomas's house next door was a parsonage for the uh, Methodist Church on. Um, it's off of Hillcrest. Off of, what was oh. it on? It's, on uh, it's the Hillcrest Methodist. Yeah, I think it's on Price. Yeah. Um, and I'm guessing it was donated to the church by the James family. It's just a guess. Um, and we heard that the uh, the garage of Thomas's house was a milking uh, shed or barn. I guess a shed, milking shed for the for the house here. So that wouldn't, I guess, been the you know the the whole. Um, operation for the farm but they probably had like a little local you know like a looking shed just for their house here i guess it sounds like there's a lot more remnant remnants of the uh, james dairy farm than we than we maybe thought or many of us thought yeah and i'm guessing a lot of the houses um, i've heard a couple of different things about houses on south haven being workers houses at some point for the for the farm that's all that's coming to mind right now so i might think of something else but um, one of you guys mentioned the uh, the Methodist Church on Price. Is that is that still a church? Is that active? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've been by there. Well, thank you, Nathan. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, get, get in touch with me at the History Project if you have more information to share, or maybe we could come out sometime and look at some of these historic remnants if that's uh, that's possible to kind of document some of this stuff. Yeah, it's great that history because you know just. Uh, Digging shallow into, you know, they would not spend hours and hours and hours on this so far, but, uh, you know, we would like to do more, particularly as a more definitive um, history of, of South Knoxville. That's, that's, that's great that you guys have found those remnants and uh, learned from the people who lived there before you. Yeah, we're, we're new to the area. Well, we've been in Knoxville for a while, but um, we just moved to South Knoxville a few years ago. So we don't know the history here. It's all, all new to us. Um, one last thing I remembered is. I think people that live here probably would know this, but um, they lived here for a while. Apparently, well, I heard that the James family also had a um, pharmacy and right next to Handy Dandy, there's an older building. I think it's the building that Mary James uh, died in, in her old age. Um, but I think that used to be a pharmacy that James had. And that was, I heard that that was kind of like the little, you know, like the nucleus of the, know, the little nucleus of the community, I guess you could say. But, I haven't, I don't know anything. I found, you know, there's lots of glass uh, shards on, on the property. Um, and also there's tons of coal ash, which you mentioned in the article that um, Gail sent me, uh, something about the Holston Distillery, which was so located somewhere in this area. I don't, I don't know, uh, but- I've not, not been able to find anything more about that. I was wondering how much ash could they, you know, really go through the house, but that makes sense with the distillery that they'd have a ton of coal ash that they would dump and spread all over the place so that's possible yeah that definitely. section along where the handy dandy is that's definitely uh if anyone out here today knows more about that property i think the handy dandy may have been around since the 70s but 
clearly has been a, a business of some kind, you know, for, for many years. I think maybe it was a grocery in the 50s. I don't have to go back to my notes, but uh, yeah, the building that would be on the, the right of it, if you're looking at it from the street, or the north north of it, um, I think is owned by Stephanie Welch, who works for the city. Um, you probably will know that. So I definitely would like to know more about that that the section, and particularly where that distillery was as well, and uh, also the you know the, the greenhouse, the Watson greenhouse. What was that on what we know as McClung? Anybody have anything to share about those? Gail, does this? Um, some of these student or, uh, stories new to you? <laughs> um, uh, that's one of the reasons that I was encouraged to do this because I've been hearing these stories and it's it's great. It's um, wonderful to get them down on paper and uh, fill them out. Um, that area is absolutely uh, interesting uh, all around it. And we were talking, you were talking about the streets and how they're renamed. Um, I have found, and a lot of people have commented on the fact that our streets around here are named after UT football players. And um, Gilbert and uh, Wes Gilbert was um, a football, UT football player before World War II. So um, our, our enchantment with football players have, have lasted a long time. But uh, Hickman and Bobby Dodd, they were football players too, So, but early. So when this di division around the Crystal Springs, and I believe that's what Crystal, uh, the Springs were called, um, was first established, people called it the Crystal Springs edition. And then the names of the streets were renamed as people became enamor enamored of um, Football players. It was Gene McK McKeever. He was one of the football players. Jack, you want to say anything about him? I know he came up as, uh, he, he, I think you could get a Gene McKeever football at uh, Newcomers on Gay Street a long time ago, didn't you, Jack? Yeah, that, he was one of the biggest stars of Neyland's early, early years. Jack, Paul, I have a question about um, the cemetery, the Flinnegan Cemetery. I just newly heard about this. Um, you, are you familiar with this? It's a Cunningham Flemington Cemetery. Yeah, I I have heard of it. I, I've um, I've researched some his some cemeteries, but not certainly not all of them. So uh, I, I I don't. Uh, so this is Paul. Have you looked into that? I have not. Where is it located, Tom? Um, uh, so on uh, Allen Home Avenue, behind Print Shop, the brewery there now, back up in the woods. Uh, the opposite way to enter it is through that uh, White House that sits up on the hill at uh, James White Parkway. With the long okay, drive. underneath, underneath the underpass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's got a long driveway off of uh, down from there into the. But, uh, um, somebody sent me a tech, uh, a photo, and I did a, what I could find. Is the Cunningham Flinnigan Cemetery and it had uh, headstones that dated back to the seven, late, late, late 1700s, which I don't know if I had any. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's remarkable uh, considering how hard it was to get to, how many people did, did live over there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it would be probably pretty easy to look to do a history of that uh, through the McClung Collection. They've got extensive cemetery records there. Okay. Let's find out how old it is and who's buried there. It's on my list to hike back up in there in the next couple of weeks. So I just didn't know. I'll take a actually, actually, there's a graveyard that's, I mean, a cave that's up on that hill. And there's some cemetery. There's, as far as I remember, graves in that, in that grave, in that cave from the Civil War. Really? I don't remember ever hearing about a, another cemetery in that area. But I remember as kids, we would go up to the caves. Hmm. I live right next to that hill growing up. So sharing that, Marilyn. Yeah, thanks. I've not, not been to that cemetery. That's something of hers to explore. Yeah, it's a, it, it, the study of history is ever challenging. I, I think there are over 400 cemeteries in Knox County. So it's uh, everyone's got its own story. And, but some of, their, some of them are, are extremely interesting. So you can't really dismiss any of them. 
you know, uh, that, that map we looked at, 1895 map, you know, you'll see names like Johnson. You know, there's Johnson, quite a few Johnsons buried at Stanton Cemetery, which is just above Meade's quarry. Uh, Giffins, I think, are buried all over the place. And uh, I know part of my research on the Imes family is that when Harry and Alice Imes bought their initial 24 acres in 1910, which was previously part of the Colonel Perez Dickinson's estate, they bought it from two ladies who lived together in this log cabin, uh, Giffen and, J and J Johnson, and uh, HP let them live there until they passed away. Um, while they had moved uh, what was a log cabin from Sevierville Pike, uh, two or three miles over to um, what we call, you know, what's called the home side at Imes today. And then he rebuilt a, a new um, story on it in the like 1923, but, uh, you know, that property has probably not changed that much in 110 years. The name Giffen and Johnson, it's still all over, all over South Haven and Island Home Park. I'm um, just following along some comments in the chat bar. Um, Jackie Willow was saying when the radio tower fell, many of the local kids collected the mercury from the tubes. Man, I guess we've moved along a bit since then. Um, and she also said, would this house have been before Lendland? I'm not sure what you mean, Jackie, by Lendland. Is there a Lendland Street? In that area there is okay yes it, uh, it, it goes it's on the block that Giffen school is uh it's on the north side of the road that Giffen school is on okay um and it, nice. it comes off south haven it just dead ends into um into james white right now hey jack here's one for you um sherry wallace barry was asking was chapman highway originally named broadway and if so do we know when the name changed do you know uh i've never heard that of course it connects directly to broadway via henley street uh and it may have been that and originally south broadway came all the way to the river so there may have been some i wouldn't be surprised if someone proposed that it be called broadway but it was it was called chapman pretty early on and david chapman who was of course the kind of the, the godfather of the smoky mountains national park movement and in, in, uh in, in terms of leadership uh was uh was still alive at the time and lived in and lived in South Knoxville over on the other side of South Knoxville from from here I think over near uh over Alco Highway beyond Alco Highway area but um uh, top side right yeah, wasn't it yeah 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 um but yeah that was uh that was a big big change and there was Chapman and there's Alcoa and that was you know before that had just been uh Maribel Pike and Sevierville Pike which both are both kind of twisty uh, country roads at the time. So uh, uh, that was a, a, a very big change for South Nossel and Nossel in general. Many of you may already know this, but who who was Maynard Glenn at the Boarfields? Um, he yeah. was a long-standing director of the City Parks and Rec, as far as I was able to, to determine. Yeah. And uh, he died, I think, suddenly after he retired, I think in 1985. Not sure if that was a park before then or Boarfields, but maybe someone on the, maybe you know already, uh, Julia, do you, do you have something to share? And you are muted, remember? Okay, Maynard Glen. I came to Maynard Glen Ballpark in 1995, and there were four fields there. And the story is that the large field that is on McClong was the field at in the beginning. And um, he ran a program through the city and that the ball games uh, were never rained out because he would land his helicopter on the field <laughs> and uh, spin the blades and the fields would dry out in time to play the games. And uh, mm. so when I when I came, there were there are now four fields and it was very run down. And I encountered Norman Bragg with the city because I couldn't believe how shoddy that the whole structure of the place was and how neglected the city um, went about their business with Maynard Glen Park. And Norman shook his fists in the air and said, I don't know why you people in South Knoxville think you're so special. <laughs> and I just lowered myself and I said, because we are, <laughs> period. And uh, so we've had good rapport with the city parks, but um, Maynard did something with like the commission was he part of the commission city uh commission tommy was he part of that structure i'm not sure i'd have to I do have, my homework i'm not sure of that either 
Now there is the Cecil Webb Rec Center that we use for basketball and Cecil mm -hmm. Webb was instrumental through uh, government. Um, so. I wonder if he was related to the, the Webb name referenced earlier by Paul. I believe so. It was C something Webb, capital C. Hmm. And there's a plaque inside of the building that indicates some of the history. Okay. Of the are there other landmarks around South Haven that we've not even mentioned today that people should know about? I didn't even know there was a cemetery and our ballpark is on McClung and, and Hackman is just right there to the uh, far side. I didn't, I didn't know. Where is the cemetery located? Cemetery okay. located at um, where Hackman Street takes a curve going uh, where there's a big huge field uh, that goes down um, and it's away from the ball field. So it's, 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 uh, if you were going out McClung Avenue and you turn left onto, onto Hackman Street, uh -huh. you go past Berea Avenue and it's the third house, the second house. It's between that house and the, the last house that's built. Okay. On the right side. I may have to go exploring. It's on their property. It's on that house's property. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we used to play there. I lived across the street from that cemetery and we used to play over there in the woods and stuff. Julia? Yes. Did you know that Maynard Glenn set up in the 50s a little league for African Americans at Maynard Glenn? I did not know that. Hmm. That's pretty um, interesting, I think. I like, think. We'll, we'll find out more about that because that's kind of early and, <laughs> you know. In the 50s. Right, in the 50s. Wow. Hmm. Well, it was that pretty progressive. <laughs> it, it was late in the era of segregation, which is the reason they had to do that, though. So uh, I guess by the mid-60s, uh, uh, black kids would have been part of the regular Little League. But hmm. that's a worthwhile thing to do, certainly. I will try to check that out. Are you seeing... Uh, have you seen African Americans and other um, ethnic groups move in to South Haven? Is it is it changing in that regard? Obviously, we're mountain bikers maybe moving in, or people wanting to be near trailheads and uh, restaurants. I mean, it's got. I remember for years, you know, unless you wanted to get a sandwich at the Handy Dandy, you had to go over to Frosty's Deli on uh, Chapman Highway. Uh, You've got a few more options now, haven't you? Where the Handy Dandy is across the street, I think it's a marathon. There's a, apartment buildings there now. And that used to be a farm when I was we were growing up. A guy had that, that whole corner of property. I mean, it wasn't a big farm, but the person that owned it, uh, Mr. Elliot, he had he had some ponies and stuff. And, and I grew up with her, his granddaughter, and we'd go over there and ride horses in the late 50s and early 60s. And that's across where the Kenjo market is? Yeah, right, right behind it, right behind right it. Right behind it, right behind yeah. it. One of the things that you can find on the, the KHP website is uh, we've done a series of driving tours and um, you start on uh, the Henley Bridge and go along Chapman and go Martin Mill Pike, uh, Maryville Pike to Martin Mill Pike and kind of wrap around all the way down Chapman and uh, come down um, Moody and along Sevierville Pike and over to William Hasty and kind of wrap around through Iam. So you don't exactly go through the heart of South Haven, but... Uh, I want to check that out. I'll put the link in a few minutes if you, you want to spend a nice afternoon, a couple of hours driving around learning more about South Knox. We haven't really discussed the other sort of area that I'm sure there was lots of um, uh, grocery stores and uh, amenities and that's, you know, where uh, Sono Taco and Roundup is. And that's, I could go back a little ways on where so Sono Taco is, but uh, my first one, or the farthest back that I could get, was it was a ta um, uh, Texaco station at, at one time. So um, it is it's housed several businesses, but I'm sure that that crossroads, as it is now, um, housed a lot of businesses. Does anybody know anything about what how it started out? Roundup's been there, I think, since the 70s. Yeah, I, I looked into that once and found that there were a few small businesses there, I think in the 50s. Um, and I, I may have, I don't have my research at my fingertips right now. I think it was when we were doing doing their search for that South Knoxville tour, or maybe before that. Yeah, there's more to 
more to learn there, certainly. Certainly, if you go, I know this is a little, you're getting a little out of South Haven, but if you do head back on Moody, back to Chapman Highway, and stop at the, tri at, the at the light there, just past James White Parkway ramp, you know, within 100 yards, um, that's where William Hastie, William Hastie's house is still there. And that's one of the stops on the tour. So that's where William Hastie gets his name. He was what Jack, the first African-American uh, governor. Exactly. The first African-American uh, federal judge in American history he was born and raised in, in South Knoxville. And, uh, and also he was the first African-American to be governor of something. He was governor of the U.S. Virgin Islands in the 1940s. Someone we should know more about than we do. If, if you want to learn more about him, uh, whenever they reopen, uh, the Beck Center has a uh, whole room devoted to him. And Jackie, I don't know if you want to go on camera today, but it sounds like that you grew up around this neighborhood and you are muted. Um, yeah, I grew up um, on Price Street. And then when I was five, we moved to Linland at the top of Linland. Um, Maryland Childress, um, you know, we're, we all grew up playing in the woods there. We used to believe that we had uh, Civil War um, dugouts like there were over at Fort Dickerson. Um, and I mean, we played Civil War <laughs> forever in our woods between, that would be between uh, Newton and Linland back there where the halls uh, family owned um, the huge stretch of woods. Um, so yeah, and the house that Marilyn and her family had up on Hillwood, that deserves, um, even though the house is gone now, that deserves a good deep dive into. I recently was looking at the uh, information about the lady who had it before they had bought it or had it. And her story is, is just, I can't remember her name now, but the story of her house, of, of her life there in Knoxville and how she ended up where she did was really interesting in her love of animals. <laughs> it was Mrs. Halls. Yeah, yeah. And they, they owned a, her husband owned a, a, a furniture factory and had, that place was made as uh, six acres in downtown Knoxville, which you'd never believe was downtown, would you, Jackie? Nope. <laughs> had all these uh, exotic trees and a fish pond and a nature trail and um, also a gardens <laughs> yeah, and separate um, building just for cars. Um, and um, when she died, she gave a lot of money to um, the nature center. I mean, to the Humane Society of Knoxville um, for them to take care of her dog, Penny. Well, Penny... Uh, didn't like where she was, so we ended up having Penny for another 10 years, and mm -hmm. Penny never left that property once she got there. Even when she got sick, the vet would have, we couldn't get her in a car ever again, and the vet would have to come to the house to, to take care of her. It's very it's interesting. There's a lot of, a lot of that got torn down, and when my parents got divorced and sold it to the next person that owned it, they, he kind of destroyed it pretty mm -hmm. much, and then the John Watt Parkway, uh, took away almost everything that's there and took away the beauty of it. It was really, really beautiful place. I remember when, when we were kids from Maryland's bedroom, you could just look down on the river. Yeah. yeah. Uh, where, where was this located again? It's Maybe? at 1725 Hillwood Avenue. Okay, Hillwood. Yeah, and they, uh, they owned it for a long time, uh, her, her family, and she, she was a remarkable person. And like I said, there were there were trees there that were from the northwest during you know, like uh, Washington, the state of Washington, that would not normally grow here. But it was in the springtime; it was beautiful. We had a gazebo. We had, I mean, <laughs> like I said, we had a nature trail that walked through the thing, and we even and Lord, had the a, Lord. The boys hated having to rake that yard because it yeah. was big. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was very interesting history about Knoxville that that particular piece of property it was a very older house I don't remember how old it was when we moved there in 1968 or no no it was 60 uh, I was in the sixth grade when we moved there so that would have been in 63. You have pictures? Yeah I do have some pictures. Oh, okay. oh, there's a the uh, driveway was where on, on uh, Hillwood now there's uh, some houses across the street from it and there's a street that goes up but well, our driveway was completely straight across from it and it was lined with beautiful uh, maple trees. 
and it was over 200 yards from the street to the house and it was just absolutely gorgeous and in uh, in my high school days i wanted a horse so we had two horses there and uh, we put fence around it and kept the two horses there when we go riding in fact in my high school uh annual me and this other girl that had a horse in my class, we our pictures were on our horses at school. <laughs> Jackie, saw, Jackie remembers my horses. Yep, yeah, yeah, I remember you'd bring them up uh, once or twice. You'd bring them up, you know, bring your horse over to Linland and give me a horseback ride. <laughs> right, right. Are you ladies went? Did you ladies go to Giffen School? Yes, we did. Yes. You were dead. Yeah, there's there's a few years difference. I'm old. I'm closer to her brother's age than Jackie's age, but I'm the baby. Person. Yeah. When did the school um, stop we, being a school? It had to be in the late 80s or early 90s because my niece okay. was there um, and she was born in 81. Yeah. And my nephew and she went there, there all the way through sixth grade or fifth grade, whatever they do now. So the year that um, I moved myself from Gap Creek to Moreland Heights School, that was the year that at uh, a large number of Giffen School students had to return to Moreland Heights because they had left. They had left because of the housing project, Montgomery Village, mm -hmm. and they went from Moreland Heights to Giffen, and they all came back because they were declined a transfer to Giffen. So it had to have been, Becca was born in 85, and she, that would have been, um, 1991 she was a first grader and I got I got probably 12 first graders I was thinking it was in the early 90s when they yeah. closed it down it had to have been right after that because all the students were pulled out and then Dogwood Elementary opened right that, that yeah. took in all those students right in that neighborhood so right now the South Haven kids go down to South South Knoxville. Knox Elementary on Sevier Avenue, or they go to Dogwood Elementary. Was Giffen a private school? No, it was, no, a, it was oh, a Knox okay. County school. You see, you had Knox County and Knox City. And it was, it was, oh gosh, it was, I was with Knox County. And then the city got out of the school business and the county had to absorb all of those Cool. Yeah, we, we recently did a kind of deep dive in the Giffen School Group on Facebook uh, about to the ever feared but <laughs> some places beloved by some people, uh, Mary Jane McCauley, who uh, was, she had been a music teacher and the music su supervisor for Knox County Schools and had taught a lot of our parents. And then we had her as the principal who made you eat everything on your plate. My brother still won't eat white rice. And he's in his 70s. I had a question for Jackie. Um, you said you, you guys played in the woods and, and you thought you found uh, like Civil War era like dugouts? No, no we um, made them. We, we just- Oh, you made them, oh, okay. We made them, yeah. Oh, okay. We did was... find a lot of arrowheads while we were playing out in the woods and especially over on Island Home Out Airport area. Cause used to, you could go out there when we were growing up, you could go out on the runways and 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 inspect and stuff like that. And my brothers would found some arrowheads back then. Oh, wow. So Marilyn, that one ditch entrenchment, did so you and the boys? dug that out I always thought it was always there well, it could have been I just don't remember us I remember I, I officially being a a civil war thing it could have been but I don't think it I mean I don't remember it, it always it. reminded me of of the trenches those dugouts it's, it's possible but some yeah. of the re people researching has never said anything I mean it's so far away but you know yeah. Yeah. it was probably it was probably a horse grave could could you see uh, Island Home Pike from that spot? If you it, couldn't if it, see anything. If, it was if, all if, heavy if, woods. Heavy woods. I mean, if the woods were if the woods were gone, if it was you know pasture, would you be in li line of sight of Island Home Pike? Because that would have been a, a road. Yeah, you probably that point. could. I mean, our house was at the very top of Linland. Okay. So, so at right, the very right, so, of so Linland. On, on the are you on the uh, let's see the south right. side of that like Linland and South Haven. Or is, does Lenland go across South Haven? Yeah, South Haven goes across Lenland. Okay, I know. Okay, 
okay. and then it goes up a hill. There's a white, an old white house uh, that the um, Underwoods had, um, and then in the late fifties, early sixties, the rest of that land behind there was was divided out. My parents bought that lot, and over time, bought some more lots connected to it. But um, yeah, it was heavy woods. The halls okay. didn't want those woods developed. And so Lindland never connected to Hackman. Which was gotcha. what the original plan was because Hackman dead ends at the at, at one place a part of the woods and then Lindland on the other side. And we played in between there because it was just, we just had a good, and it was easy to get to her house and our house going through the woods yeah. instead of going around. I was curious why they, why those had been left like that. So, who, uh, who was it that just didn't want it developed? And wanted the to halls, H A L L S, the halls. Barry Rose Kennedy Hall, okay, um, now has I think possession of that. Mm -hmm. But that that big block of land they did not want developed. My father designed our house, and when he designed it, he designed it with the front door facing what would be the road, which never happened. Mm. So no one ever came to our front door. <laughs> uh, I was going to mention real fast that, um, so I live just, just down the street from Lenland, like uh, between Mary James and Lenland on South Haven. And I have found the Civil War bullets in, in my yard. Um, they're right next to the porch as possible. A kid was playing with them and dropped them in, the, you know, what became a flower bed at some point and they got buried very deep at that, from that. It's also, you find Civil War bullets around here and there, so it's possible it was, you know, the soldiers would have been going through looking for, you know, rat, you know, stuff to eat, and I was thinking if you did see something that looked like it might be a dugout, why it might be there, I was just thinking they were kind of keeping it, someone had to keep an eye on, uh, on Island Home Pike, probably, so just an idea, because I think it was, I think that was a road in the 1860s, but I'm not actually positive on that, so it's just a guess. Yeah, you knew anything about Civil War? in this area yeah well the the closest thing i know of is fort stanley which was on the the main interest in the union army of, uh, in the south area was the tops of the hills which were vitally important to to control uh and the only the closest thing to a battle in that area i know of was when very early in the confederate siege there was a an approach on to Fort Dickerson uh, that didn't get very close actually. But um, so there were some shots fired over mainly on the other side of what's now Chapman Highway, but um, but who knows? I mean, uh, I, I don't doubt there were encampments and, and, and artifacts can move around some as, as you mentioned. So there wasn't any activity. I mean, I, I don't know, I'll just say, I don't know of any of any shooting going on right in the South Haven area. Well, we appreciate everyone joining us today. Thanks yeah, for doing this. We, uh, we are recording right? it by the way, and we will, uh, We'll get it edited and posted it on our site. I, I will create a South Haven page and uh, probably get with Gail and uh, you know, come up with a summary at some point and uh, you know, we'll just kind of keep adding to it. And uh, like I say, Jack and I definitely uh, funding, depending on funding, but um, we'd definitely love to do a book, four color book on South Knoxville like we've done on Beard and, and uh, kind of continue to you know, en engage the community and uh, help us learn and continue to be kind of inspired by the past and keep telling these stories for, for Knoxville. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for participating. It's been wonderful. And a lot of this we, we would also really like to capture uh, on um, the oral histories because those stories are great. <laughs> Thank you everyone. Please Thank you, Paul. You. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Have a great, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks. Yeah.